I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutin. You're watching Consider This, the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. Now, what has the COVID-19 crisis taught us about our capacity to manage public health crises? Joining us on the show tonight to help us better understand the resilience of Malaysia's healthcare systems and the values underlying our public health policies, we have Dr. Dr. Lukman Hakim Sulaiman. He's the former Deputy Director General for Public Health. Dr. Lukman, good evening. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'd like to begin with a look at the situation in Sabah, if I may. Now, news reports have described full of beds with sick COVID-19 patients, understaffed hospitals, PPE stocks running low and... Um, Medical frontliners fatigued. Many of the medical frontliners have contracted uh, the coronavirus themselves. Now, the district of Sampurna has also been dubbed uh, Little Wuhan. It's the worst hit district in Sabah. I think there are over 600 co active COVID-19 cases there. Dr. Loma, what went wrong in Sabah? Was, was this a situation that we could have anticipated and perhaps prevented? Well, I think... Uh... There are so many things that are happening in Sabah, but I think one important factor that we need to consider that logistically, I mean, geographically, Sabah is very different from Peninsula of Malaysia. All right, it's a very big state. The population has passed, uh, um, uh, isolated from one another, and logistically, it's challenging. Uh, it's making uh, the size of the state of Sabah, you know, it's as big as, uh, as Peninsula of Malaysia. And in terms of the infrastructure of the healthcare system, I mean, uh, uh, the norm, the number the, 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 the infrastructure is certainly, I mean, uh, we are talking about um, the size of the peninsula, if only one uh, uh, state direct uh, office, and probably one. A, a, a number of uh, uh, public office in Peninsula Malaysia. So that's the size we are talking about. So um, certainly, I mean, in terms of the logistic of managing the situation, it's very, very challenging. Unless we give up in the, the, the support for the, the public health system. Uh, when I say public health system, these are the health system outside the hospital. We are doing all the basic things of, of, of contact tracing, of, of actual, uh, detecting the cases, and ensuring uh, people complying to, to the SOP. Uh, because unless we strengthen the primary care uh, and corrective uh, and directive action team on the ground, uh, no sophisticated hospital or, or expertise in the hospital will be able to, 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 uh, to treat this kind of challenges. So certainly the hospital will be over them. So it is important for, for, for the ministry to look at how to, to strengthen the, uh, the uh, public health components of the city. Dr. Ufman, I understand uh, you, you just outlined some of the, the real challenge there in Sabah, but, uh, you know, it, it's onset of the, uh, the pandemic uh, and the call for flattening the curve was precisely to buy time for the public health system to catch up, to, uh, to evaluate its blind spots or its weaknesses in order that we would not be in a situation like this. Do you think uh, Sabah remained a blind spot for the federal authorities for the health ministry uh, in terms of what was uh, lacking in the Sabah health system? Yeah, I mean, there has been a first, I thought, I mean, uh, after the first wave of the COVID, that there, there is commitment in, in government to strengthen the public health element of it. I think probably this is something that, uh, and that has uh, been planned for, but I don't know probably the speed at, at which the, the uh, uh, government is addressing this problem probably is a bit slow. As a result, when uh, the uh, 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 triggers that cause the 
probably too. And we are not prepared for that. Well, what do you think caused um, this, perhaps, if I may, a delayed reaction? Is it a lack of communication? Do, is it uh, not understanding the situation on the ground? Or is it simply logistics and, and as you outlined, yeah, the yeah. geographical nature of the, the territory? Yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, resources, is, uh, I mean, whether we, the government has been resources to, 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 to address those problems. But, I mean, I can't answer that question because I won't know. Uh, I mean, what that's been done. So, but definitely, I mean, in, when we look at the uh, whether how much improvement has been made with regard to the strengthening of the uh, public confidence of, of the of, of the university, that's something that probably we need to, to look into and probably to expedite that uh, in, in the near future. And we need to be aggressive in that aspect, not only in Sabah, but also in international Malaysia. We are seeing that cases are coming up, even in Peninsula. And unless we strengthen the, the public health uh, components of the, of the survey, we can take cases out of Canada. Dr. Ogman, one of the, uh, you know, kind of talking points or controversies that erupted over the Sabah issue was a statement made by a politician now with the new government uh, responding to the fact that there wasn't a health portfolio in the new Sabah state government. And he said, well, Sabah does not need a health minister. Uh, what's your sense of the way in which we govern and the governance structures of health well, is a health minister at the state level actually useful? I think we must remember that health is always a federal government's responsibility. But surely, I, I guess I'm just wondering whether this present pandemic highlights the need for perhaps a more devolved decision-making structure in public health. Because yes, uh, you know, not too long ago we spoke to Selangor State I, Government. They said, you know, it's the local people, the people on the ground that knows what's happening on the ground. Yeah, what, what, for what, what, what uh, I mean, in what context are we talking about this, this, this centralization for I mean, it depends on how you look at it. I mean, as I see, I mean, in terms of policy and, and, and policy development, it's important to have a united uh, uh, mechanism, meaning a centrally governed policy with regard to, to the health services. But the implementation is of those policies can be run by the by the state and the district. And that's what 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 it is the, the current system is. The state then the state and the uh, district of the department and given the budget to to, to carry out all the policies. I think to totally decentralize the, the, the system I think we have to be very careful about that. But each state or uh, state uh, the state may have their own policies which may not I mean uh, can with each other. I, I think we have to be careful with I mean, uh, the, what we meant by, by decentralization and to ensure that we uh, uh, support uh, enough for all the state and district to get out of future. Right, I, I understand your argument, right? So a, com a strong command structure, coherent policy, and then implementation down the line. But what about feedback? What about responsiveness to a, a specific local problems? And this is something that seems to be coming up in the discussions. Uh, the National Security Council not inviting Pakatan-led states or uh, the unwillingness to uh, sync different apps and you know information technology. Is there, in your view, enough feedback up to central command so that they're making the right decisions? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that. I mean, probably there are instances, instances that, I mean, a situation where uh, it seems that the state, uh, especially when those are governed by a different uh, government from the federal government, having some issues with that. But I don't think that should happen. I mean, that should happen, and it didn't happen at all. I mean, because to me, health is such a, shouldn't be such political. It should be a political when it comes to mental health. I and mean, I think it's important for for the government, the state of Africa, to understand this concept that they have to work. Because at the end of the day, it's a, the, the health and the, the, the safety of the public, of the public that is the matter. I mean, Dr. Lema, we're going to have you stay on the line. We're going to take a quick break, but we'll come back and continue this conversation in just a couple of minutes. Stay tuned. Hi, 
Hi, if you've just joined us, you're watching Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. With me is Sharad Kutun. We're speaking with former Deputy Director General for Public Health, Datuk Dr. Lukman Hakim Sulaiman, about Malaysia's COVID-19 response and recovery. Now, let's talk about the global race to get a place in the waiting line for that potential COVID-19 vaccine. So, uh, Fitch Solutions had recently highlighted that political ties are playing a role in emerging COVID-19 vaccine deals between Malaysian and China-owned companies. And this came on the back of news that Kangar International, which is a Malaysian bamboo flooring manufacturer, they had recently announced a three-year license agreement with China's state-owned pharmaceutical company, Sinopharm, this to sell the COVID-19 vaccine uh, in Malaysia. So, Dr. Lukman, now you made a very cryptic remark uh, saying that in negotiating for bilateral agreements to procure a vaccine, Malaysia should not cede national sovereignty. If I may quote you, you said any bilateral agreement will always have political and economic interest in it. Malaysia should never compromise um, on the national and economic security in any bilateral negotiation, end quote. I'd like you to explain what you meant by that. What, what were you referring to in yes, this remark? As I, as, as I said, as I mentioned, in any negotiation, bilateral negotiation, be whatever it is, there's all this uh, geopolitics into that. And there's always um, political consideration that to be made. There's always economic consideration to be made. So, what I'm trying to say is that we should not compromise any aspect of the nation's sovereignty uh, when, when we're dealing with this kind of, of, of bilateral management. So, but of course, we will um, leave it to the government to be able to negotiate to get the best deal for, them for, 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 for the country. And remember, that when the vaccine is out later on, every country in the world is trying to assess this Vaccine. And you can imagine, I mean, um, um, the, the scramble for, for the access to the vaccine to protect the population. So, if you have a good uh, bilateral relationship with any country that produces the vaccine, and you can come up with something that the best, the best to the to the world, that would be uh, something that we, we look forward. Dr. Lopman, you know, there's been a public debate, a uh, discussion, if you like, about uh, the COVAX initiative uh, versus, you know, in, in this and what Melissa just mentioned, this bilateral agreement, uh, multilateral agreements versus uh, bilateral agreements, uh, all in all kind of structured around the possibility of a vaccine. So kind of hedging your bets putting down money as an insurance. Where do you stand, I mean, between the COVAX initiative, and seems to be some flip-flopping on that, uh, versus, you know, individual uh, agreements. What's your take on the COVAX controversy? Okay, I mean, certainly COVAX is, is a very new instrument that has never been used before. And this is something that, uh, I mean, every everyone has to appreciate that. Certainly, when it comes to a new instrument, that's a, that's a maybe, maybe Many aspects that we are, we are we not the expert in this area might have issued with it. But I think as a member of the public health, of the WHO advisory group for pandemic preparedness, and I have uh, accepted some of the discussion about this topic, but I thought the principle behind COVID is, is to get to, to coordinate the, the access to the vaccine. I mean, remember, I mean, what the, uh, the WHO's interest is trying to get that every uh, population in the world has equal access to the to, 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 to the vaccine when, it, when, when they are available. And I think this is what we should try to do, to get to pull up the all the member states to come together so that when you go for a bulk purchasing, certainly you, you have the economic power to to, to, to negotiate for a for, for, uh, cheaper price, isn't it? So, so Dr. Lokman, I take it that you think the, the COVAX initiative is actually a good one? Remember, under the, according to the COVAX system, every vaccine that to be, to be, to, to be uh, um, acquired will have to undergo the pre-qualification exercise and, and verification by the WHO. That these vaccines are safe, these vaccines are efficacious. Mm -hmm. And the WHO are not talking just about one vaccine, they are talking about multiple process of the, of the vaccine. So because in, in, this, in this in the current scenario, we, no one is certain which vaccine is going uh, to, 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 be, uh, to be the one that to be the most effective and, uh, and safe. 
So the, the bigger the number of portfolio of vaccines you have, the better chance of you getting a better, better deal. Do you, do you, you think that Malaysia can answer, afford, Dr. Lukman, do you think that Malaysia can afford to to join this? Because I understand it will cost about four, 42 million ringgit to join the COVAX plan, after which we will be bonded yes, to mean, purchase that vaccines that at a cost of 600 million. WHO is working towards something like uh, 10 to 20 US dollar per dose. So now, what's the the, the cost of the uh, for for in, 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 uh, of vaccine through uh, bilateral or, or individual purchase? So something that you have to consider. I will not know. I mean, if, if by logic, I mean, if you pull up the 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 the, 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 uh, the countries and you have the box purchase. Then you, you get a better deal in terms of price. price. So at least, and then with a multiple number of uh, vaccine portfolio, I mean, if one doesn't work, then at least you have got other alternatives. But if you are only dependent on one bilateral negotiation, what if the, suddenly the vaccine doesn't work? Mm. So what I'm trying to say is, I think the government needs to consider both. They have to wait out all the issues. I mean, uh, to look at both, both mechanisms. I mean, of course, if, if the government can get a good bilateral uh, deal with any, uh, any, any producer, well, I mean, that's good. And you get a very good, affordable vaccine that is safe and efficacious. Fine. I mean, we have to look. But, I mean, that's what I'm trying to say is that um, be open about it. Of course, I mean, there's a lot of issues with COVID because something very big. Of course, for the WHO to start with, WHO doesn't have money to, to buy it, to, 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 to purchase the, the vaccine uh, up front. And certainly, they need the contribution from, from the member states. And, and uh, for that matter, I mean, I don't know, I mean, how the mechanism of calculating the the, the, the difference, but I thought that's something that the member states can also negotiate with the WHO. It's not something that's fixed. Right, Dr. Lokman, there's also this attendant conversation, right? Because the, the, the presumption is that these many vaccine candidates will turn into one or several uh, viable vaccines. But barring that, uh, and, and there is, at least from the professional community, your community of medical professionals, that caution us from thinking that this is the silver bullet, that we need to think about public health measures more than place our bets on vaccines. Watching the ongoing conversation about the vaccine, where do you think this conversation is going? Do you think a, vac a new a vaccine is likely or should we be working at other dimensions of the problem uh, at this uh, point in time? Like, like any other health uh, issues, I think we cannot just be dependent on one strategy. We have to use all uh, whatever strategy that's available. And if vaccine safe and efficacious vaccine is available and affordable, then why not? We, you, know, you should use it. And, and together with the other uh, public health strategies uh, that, that's already uh, in place. Are you concerned about vaccine hesitancy? We will, there will be always uh, issues about uh, this uh, vaccine hesitancy. But um, as far as Malaysia is concerned, I think we are not that, that bad. Although, the, uh, I mean, looking at the rate of, of, of our childhood immunization program, we are, we, are, we are still doing fine. But of course, the challenges are always there. And uh, we will never uh, be, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, we don't, we're going to continue to face that, uh, that kind of, of challenge in, in this country. But I don't think that's a, that's a big uh, a very big issue. Okay. All right, Dr. Loman, another quick break, but we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Stay tuned to consider this. so much for staying with Sharad and I on Consider This. Let's continue our conversation with Dr. Dr. Lukman Hakim Sulaiman, former Deputy Director General for Public Health. Dr. Lukman, I love this mantra, the Build Back Better mantra. Now, um, what would you point to with, uh, in that regard, the Build Back Better? With, with regard to the Malaysian healthcare system, what do we need to build back better? 
uh, sorry, I didn't get what, what, what you asked me. So the mantra that, uh, that you know, in the time of uh, COVID-19 is a chance to rethink the way we've been doing things, to build things back better, not just to go back to the status quo, but to change it up a little bit. What do you think that the Malaysian public health system needs to build back better? I think uh, we need to really be serious about giving priority to the preventive and promotive healthcare system and the, and the primary care system. I mean, those all have services before, the, I mean, uh, outside the hospital. Now, if you look at the infectious disease scenarios, and, I mean, if you, you should be able to prevent the infection from getting to the hospital. I mean, either you get it of them early, manage them early, isolate them early in the case of COVID, you take them isolate them early. So you need a strong team to do that. And, and so that we, the hospital will not be flooded with, with the severe cases uh, of, uh, of, of the infection. So these issues of, of, of giving priority to, to public health um, elements of the healthcare system have been a long, long-term issue. I mean, if you look at the national budget, it's only about probably less than 10 percent of the total um, uh, national budget, uh, budget uh, dedicated for uh, public health services and for government services. Whereas we know that investment in this health promotion and prevention is much, much better in terms of the uh, uh, return of investment. So I think the government really needs to look very seriously and implement those services. I mean, the PM has already announced it, that. Uh, that we, we need to, to focus on the public health component elements of the health services and, and the public health services. I think we need to translate that into real action. Dr. Oman, can help us understand what this strong team that you talk about uh, consists of. Is it only doctors uh, and nurses? What exactly would go into s building that infrastructure in terms of people? I mean, if you look at, I mean, it's not just doctors. It's all the uh, like health sciences uh, 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 personnel that are required to, to do the activity. For example, um, in healthcare, health promotion, for example, people who, who continue to to to, to, to uh, promote health among the population. I mean, it's not, not just like even like NCD, for example. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to encourage and to change the behavior of patients with a healthy lifestyle, but you need more activity in this area, and you need the people to, to do all these kind of things. Where do you think the barriers are to achieving that? Is it budgetary? Is it cost? Is it collective will? Is it policy? What is stopping us from building back better? If you, if you talk about uh, public health costs, it's much cheaper than running the hospital. It's much, much cheaper. But I think it's, it's the issue of how people look at the, uh, at, 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 at the system. I mean, all, I am, almost every politician will see that they, I mean, having the hospital as if the answer to all this problem. But you don't understand. I mean, without a good, strong uh, primary care system and uh, preventive or promotive care, I mean, you're not going to say that. The, 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 the more and more people get sick and more and more people get to be sick in the hospital and that will as certainly going to escalate the cost of the healthcare system. So unless we strengthen the primary care and the public health system, I think I think we will be in a situation when get care is no more sustainable. Even at this stage I would say that I mean, the current system may not be sustainable any longer. Dr. Lokman, uh, you're turning our away, uh, attention away from the state and what governments ought to do. Uh, you talked about primary, uh, primary health care system. Well, what about the responsibility of individuals, of the citizen? Do you think, in your experience, that Malaysians understand how important it is to keep themselves healthy? I don't think so. <laughs> if you look at the problem of NCDs, I mean, I don't think we really care uh, um, about our own health. Uh, when I was in office last time, I commented about the poor uptake of the uh, social medical team by the members. You know? 
by giving the, the opportunity for men to pick up the medical system, only uh, less than 30% of the opportunity. And if we look at how we eat uh, and we live, I don't think we, um, we really care so much uh, about our own health. So, but of course, these are all the behavioral um, aspects that need to be addressed. And we need to work more on this aspect. If you do, if you know that, you will continue to, to, to escalate and become bigger problem. You have to address this problem, and we need more content to, to champion for uh, for the change of life and lifestyle among the population. Dr. Lokman, thank you so much for joining us on the show tonight. We really appreciate your time and your insights. Thank you. That's all we have for you on this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutin, signing off for the evening. Thank you so much for watching. Good night.